Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. This is Christina Bain, and I'm the Director of the Initiative on Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery at Babson College uh, in the United States. And I want to welcome everyone uh, to our conversation today and our fourth webinar in our ongoing series on uh, new technologies, innovation, and entrepreneurship to tackle human trafficking. And I'm very excited about the topic today. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, entrepreneurship uh, and promising practices of on innovative entrepreneurship to combat human trafficking. And uh, before we start the conversation, we're going to make uh, a few announcements and, and go over some programming. Uh, and firstly, I want to thank my co-sponsors of this webinar in the webinar series, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and the International Organization for Migration, our generous supporters, Denton's LLP, uh, and also the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center at George Mason University. And to just give you a bit of background about um, Denton's, who, was, who through their generous support were able to have these webinars. Uh, Denton's is a global law firm. It's actually the largest global law firm uh, in the world. And uh, in the United States, they're based in Washington, D.C. and in Atlanta. Uh, and they do tremendous pro bono work related to human trafficking, particularly labor trafficking, uh, is, a, is a focus of theirs. They do convenings in their Washington, D.C. office. And I really encourage you to go to their website uh, and, at www.dentons.com and check out the work that they're doing under some of their um, initiatives, particularly related to, to women and girls uh, and human trafficking. I think you'll really enjoy what you find there. So thank you to Denton for their incredible support. I also want to thank the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at George Mason University, in particular Dr. Louise Shelley and Casey Crenard, who work on these webinars with us and, and promote them. Thank you for your leadership uh, in this work, and we're so grateful to have you uh, as a supporter on these webinars. So now, um, before I um, begin on, in talking about some of the other programs, I'm going to talk about my own program at Babson College. And we actually started this program with the very uh, topic that we're talking about here today in mind about how you can utilize the power of entrepreneurship in the field of combating human trafficking. And the mission of the Program on Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery at, uh, at Babson is to really bring together uh, entrepreneurial minds, students, and business leaders, corporate NGO, and governmental partners, and other stakeholders um, from around the globe in order to learn, network, and build uh, really innovative and entrepreneurial approaches to advancing human freedom. Uh, we also look to leverage the expertise and resources from Babson um, as a cutting-edge research institution to create further research and classroom approaches, uh, including teachings and convenings and, and option-oriented initiatives with our students uh, and with the Boston area community and global community to educate and activate the next generation and current uh, anti-trafficking activists uh, and business leaders in this field. And some of the exciting things we're doing uh, related to teaching, we are teaching something called the Human Freedom Entrepreneurial Leadership Program, which works with secondary and high school students uh, in the United States to engage them in creating their own startup and their own entrepreneurial initiative uh, to stop human trafficking. And then we have a competition uh, to give them seed money for the best project uh, to go on and so that they can advance in the world of combating human trafficking uh, and begin their business or nonprofit. So we're doing just this, the, the topic uh, that we're talking about today uh, at Babson College. So I couldn't be more excited to present, present a topic. Uh, in addition, and you're going to hear more about this uh, from my colleague uh, and dear friend, Livia Wagner from the Global Initiative, we are uh, working on the respect uh, initiative from which the, this webinar series is a part of. Uh, this webinar is the fourth webinar um, in the series on, on new technology, but we've also done two other series um, that you can see presently on the Global Initiative website, and, and Livia will tell you more about this. But these webinars are part of a broader initiative called the Responsible and Ethical Coalition, Private Sector Coalition Against Human Trafficking, or the RESPECT Initiative. And we have four different uh, pillars as a part of this initiative. We're building a web portal, 
we are all with resources and, and promising practices, anti-trafficking practices for the private sector and, and other stakeholders, we're uh, creating a student case competition uh, for MBA and public policy schools. We're also have, having this webinar series, and we're also creating a stakeholder needs assessment. And Livia will talk a little bit more um, about some of these pillars, but we're thrilled that this webinar series could, could launch uh, this work, and I could have no better of a partner in um, the global initiative and, and the International Organization for Migration. So um, thank you for being us, with us for this work. So before um, Livia speaks, I just want to tell um, the world a bit about the International Organization for Migration um, and their work um, protecting migrant workers from exploitation and abuse. Um, we're thrilled to have them join in as a partnership in this work. So here's just a brief um, slide deck on, on some of the work that IOM is doing right now. Um, and many of you on, the, on this call I know are familiar uh, with their work. Um, they're an intergovernmental organization that was established in 1951 and they joined the UN system um, in 2016 officially. Um, they have 166 member states and eight observer states, 10,000 staff working in over 100 countries. Uh, they also have the Migrant Assistance Division, or MAD, um, and key areas of focus with this division are protection of migrants in vulnerable situations, including victims of trafficking, forced labor, and other forms of exploitation and abuse, and also assisted voluntary return and reintegration um, programming within this division. Uh, they also, the IOM also works with governments, UN, civil society, organizations, and the private sector to prevent and address human trafficking and labor rights violations. Uh, they also provide protection and assistance. Um, and so far, it's been um, 85,000 plus victims um, assisted since 1994. Uh, they also contribute to policy development, legal frameworks, SOPs, codes of conduct, et cetera, capacity building with governments and other stakeholders, prevention, including awareness raising, data collection, data analysis, and research, and also dialogue and cooperation, which goes along with their convening capabilities. They have a strong engagement with the private sector. Uh, they also um, uh, have a um, uh, collaboration with industry leaders. Um, can everyone hear me at this point? Zach, can you hear me? I'm just getting a message that I'm not able to be heard. Uh, yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so they work in multiple sectors to help and prevent and address exploitation of workers in supply chains. Uh, they also work in policy development and compliance monitoring, promotion of ethical recruitment, uh, including split supply chain mapping, uh, capacity building, guidance for the provision of effective remedies um, to victims of exploitation and abuse, including trafficking and child labor, um, facilitation of dialogue and cooperation, uh, and also research, uh, really critical research that they're doing. So uh, that is the work that um, the International Organization for Migration is doing, so I encourage you to look more um, at their diverse portfolio. And again, we're so grateful to have them on board um, in partnership uh, for the RESPECT initiative. And now I want to introduce my, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Olivia Wagner, who's the private sector advisor for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, who's going to tell you about the dynamic work uh, that the Global Initiative is doing right now um, in terms of their initiatives combating not only human trafficking but other forms of uh, illicit activities. So, Livia, I'm, I'm giving the ball to you. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, Christina. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And we're also very happy to have uh, the two partners of the Babson College and IOM for not only for this webinar series, but also for the RESPECT initiative as a whole. Um, I'm going to give a very brief um, introduction on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Um, sorry. Yeah, here we are now. Can everybody see? Yeah, here the introduction on, on the Global Initiative. Um, the Global Initiative is a network of prominent law enforcement, um, governance and development experts who are dedicated to seeking new and innovative strategies and responses to organized crime. So um, the GI was conceived after a series of closed forum discussions and, um, and the, with senior law enforcement officials, experts from different organizations and development practitioners 
who call for a network of experts to develop a more strategic and global approach to counter organized crime. And um, the network now comprises more than 150 independent um, global and regional experts working on different areas like um, law enforcement, human rights, democracy, governance, and development issues. And uh, yeah, we're based in Geneva, Switzerland. And, um, and the objectives are threefold. Uh, there is a first, it's strategic. That means we want to promote a more effective joined up um, responses to organized crime, but also analytical. That means we want to raise awareness and also open the debate uh, of the nature extended impact um, of organized crime. And uh, responsive, um, the AGI wants to serve as a resource uh, to partner with national, regional, and international players from different um, entities. And here, the substantive priorities, uh, you see the different forms of organized crime. Uh, we, in particular, are going to, are looking at the human trafficking um, form of organized crime. And just here, an overview of selected activities, what we're doing. Um, Christina, me, or I'm looking on particularly on the RESPECT initiative, which um, she mentioned already is a private sector platform for business community. That, me, that means um, we are inviting business leaders, but also uh, other stakeholders to um, not only work together, but also to bring together thought leaders to tackle the issue of human trafficking and forced labor in international um, supply chain. That means we're going to have, based on the stakeholder needs assessment, we're going to have the response from the business community, what is still missing out there and what is it what we can focus on for the next period and where we can join our forces. So we are very happy to invite businesses from all the different sizes to join our RESPECT initiative. You will also find more information on our website. Um, as well as also, I'm just jumping a bit ahead, as well as also other forms of um, publications that you can see here that do um, look at the issues, for instance, of um, human trafficking related to organized crime and illegal gold mining in Latin America, or um, um, smuggling of migrants and the implications uh, here uh, in Europe, but also in the middle, you can see the webinar report from the 2015 webinar series. So we're going to compile all this information on a portal. It's going to be launched um, in fall this year. So um, stay tuned to uh, the news on the RESPECT initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Livia. Thank you for the um, incredible work that you do, and um, it's wonderful um, to have you as a partner in this work, so thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I, I just want to go over a couple of technical um, points before I um, introduce our, um, our, our speakers and our um, uh, dynamic uh, group of panelists. I just want to go over just some procedural things. So we are recording this webinar. This webinar will be available um, to anyone who was not able, who's not able to either stay for the entire two hours, um, for anyone who registered, and, and just anyone who is interested. Um, so this will be available and will also be posted on our respective uh, websites and also uh, eventually on our web portal uh, for the RESPECT initiative. Uh, so. One of the things, too, so for when we're communicating today, um, if all of you who are participating have access to the text chat box, you'll see the text chat box in the right-hand side of the, um, of the, of the screen, um, lower right-hand side. And what you can do is text any questions, comments um, for any of our speakers. If any of you is, are having problems with audio or technical challenges, um, you know, please uh, go there and, and we're going to be tracking the conversation in there, sending links, um, sending in other information to the text chat box. Um, so that's for all of us to use to communicate. Uh, so 
And, and do um, feel free, if you can't see the box or you're not able to use it, you can email me at cbain, B-A-I-N, at babson.edu, and I will help you um, to find that. Um, Zach, I'm having a problem. I am not able to move the ball back from Livia. Can you possibly give the ball back to me? Of course, yeah. Send it Thank over you. right now. It's stuck. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. This is the um, excitement when Christina isn't in, in the Babson studio, but um, broadcasting from another country. So uh, this is what happens. Anyway, so um, so now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, our first uh, speaker, who is actually a veteran uh, to our uh, webinars, and uh, we're thrilled to welcome him back. And I'm I'm really excited to hear from him in particular because our topic today is. Um, about um, entrepreneurship, but also looking at it in a historical context about what it was like, um, you know, when, to start out and, and to create um, the various organizations that we now have seen in the field, um, you know, for 10 or 12 years or so. But when we began, you know, this modern movement of anti-trafficking, all of this was so new. So, so I'm just thrilled to have someone like James on board who's been, who's been starting organizations um, for years, who can give us a historical perspective of what it was like, um, and also, you know, to be uh, an entrepreneur um, and hit the lessons learned uh, in the field of combating human trafficking. So, so James has an incredible background, and and I can't even do it justice with with this brief biography. But he is the co-founder um, and in, in an international lawyer. Um, he's the co-founder of um, Treble Partners, which is what he's representing today, and he's going to talk to you more about that. But he's also an international lawyer and an academic researcher based in London. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy, politics, and economics from York University, uh, a graduate diploma in law and bar vocational qualification from the University of uh, Law, and a first-class master's degree in international relations from King's College London. Uh, so he has an extensive background. Um, from a legal perspective. Um, alongside his legal practice, um, he's also currently undertaking a part-time PhD um, in research at King's College uh, in London with a thesis entitled Profitable Ethics, the Relationship Between the Eradic Eradication of Slavery and Enhanced Commercial Performance. Uh, and this research is going to feed into his work that he's going to tell us about today um, and that he's spearheading, and he's seeking to engender a new business culture in relation to the employment of migrant and other vulnerable workers. Um, so he's um, also, in his role as, a, as an attorney, he's, he's developed a practice focusing on quasi-criminal and commercial work. Um, in 2006, he founded FSI Worldwide, which was a UN gift award-winning socially entrepreneurial company uh, whose initial focus was on protecting the rights of former military personnel working in post-conflict and hostile environments. Um, this organization now operates in nine countries and has protected many thousands of workers across multiple geographies and industry sectors from unlawful exploitation uh, through its ethical recruitment and management systems, and they're widely recognized as an industry leader. Um, and he also has found Lincoln Associates, a highly successful UAE-based legal and commercial advisory practice, um, which has helped a large number of companies and individuals in that region with a range of issues, particularly related to employment rights. Um, and he's going to talk again more about um, his background with a lot of these organizations. Um, and uh, we're just so thrilled to have him. He's also a musician. Um, he's a drummer and in a band um, that has played globally. So in addition to uh, his incredible work as an entrepreneur, he's also an entrepreneur in his own right um, in the music world. So James, thank you so much for being here and, and joining us again, and the floor is yours. Christina? I'm not sure yes. he, he, sounds, he sounds terrible. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> you, you do have the ball now. Great, thanks. I'm just going to try and pull up some slides. Um, yeah, let me just get back to the beginning. So, yeah, thanks very much. Good morning to you in the United States. Good afternoon to you in Europe. Um, as Christina said, it's my job just to give you a little bit of a historical context in, as to how we, uh, as entrepreneurs working in this space, have seen the development of the uh, legal, commercial, and other protocols 
surrounding the issue of modern slavery and to identify whether those changes have actually resulted in any meaningful progress in the fight against modern slavery. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the things that I'm working on at the moment, one with a, a litigation focus and one with a technology focus. And uh, hopefully that will give you a bit of a flavor for the sort of work that I'm doing and the sorts of things that I'm experiencing while we're out there. So the first slide, and this is, the, the slides really are just there as an aid memoir. They're not really designed to be followed, but they're there as a, as a bit of a structural help. Uh, as Christina kindly said, uh, back in 2006, I, I co-founded along with um, Tristan and Nick Forster and others, a company called FSI, which uh, is one of, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say, still very few dedicated ethical employment companies working around the world. That organization was very specifically set up to, to try and protect the rights of migrant workers coming from the South Asian and East, East African corridors into the Gulf. And although we've learned a lot in doing that, the fact is that there's still quite a lag in take up in terms of companies and governments wanting to align their purchasing structures and their management structures with the sorts of protocols that we've been pioneering. And I'll come and talk about that a bit more uh, later. When we first started this, as, as the slide says, there wasn't much in the way of uh, either legal or political interest in this um, modern slavery human trafficking uh, problem. And what we've seen over the course of the last 10 years, if we're looking for reasons to be cheerful, is a, 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 an absolutely seismic change in the um, legal and political attitudes towards uh, modern slavery and indeed some, some pretty grown up uh, laws. And you'll see on the slide there um, uh, the, the, the federal acquisition regulations, the, which are the, um, the rules governing the ways that um, uh, US government purchases goods and services they have uh, incrementally become much more grown up around trafficking in persons. Uh, initially in 2009, again in 2011, and, and again uh, in 2015. So they, they've become much more aware of the situation. If you compare that to sort of 2007, 2008, when I first traveled to Washington and spoke to, to audiences about, about this problem, it, it's clear that the US uh, administration, particularly under uh, President Obama, uh, really got to grips with that as, as an issue. So that's, that's been really heartening to see. Whether that continues under the current president is a matter of some conjecture, but certainly I think we can be very proud of the, the work and the progress that the American administration, previous American administration, have done to date. And that coincided with the California Act in 2010, which those of you who are interested will know was very much the blueprint for the Modern Slavery Act, the UK Modern Slavery Act was passed uh, two years ago in the UK. Uh, and that, that, that law is uh, quite groundbreaking in some respects because it allows for, um, uh, in fact, requires companies to um, look through their supply chain, report on issues relating to modern slavery, uh, and, and publish publicly their, their findings. And the idea with both the California Act and the UK Modern Slavery Act is that uh, the community, the business community, will learn from each other, uh, that they will be um, open and honest and collaborative in terms of their efforts, and that they, those, those efforts will result in a greater um, focus on and solutions, you know, ways of finding solutions to modern slavery problems. Whether that's actually happened, again, is a matter of conjecture. I think that the, um, the intention is good, uh, and there have been some conspicuous examples of companies that really have done very well in that, in that space. Most of them were already out in front in terms of uh, business ethics anyway, but nonetheless, it is true to say that, that both the California Act in the US and the Modern Slavery Act in the UK have, have at least uh, at the very least, uh, change the, the narrative and the agenda around modern slavery, and that is very much to be welcomed. 
I've mentioned President Obama, his executive order of 2013, which very specifically talked about trafficking persons in modern slavery, was very welcome. Uh, as a political commitment, it was, it was imperative, really, that we saw that sort of leadership. And we saw it also, to be fair to her, from the former Home Secretary, now Prime Minister of the UK, Theresa May. So uh, that sort of gives you a, a, a bit of a um, whistle-stop tour of some of, some of the uh, legal changes that we've seen and some of the, the political impetus in terms of the US and the UK. Some of that has also been replicated in the European Union. And I, I know we have uh, on the call today a number of uh, our friends from, from Sweden, other parts of Europe. Um, there, there are some interesting new uh, um, uh, some legislative um, innovations coming, particularly from France, which is, uh, French have just passed an interesting law requiring uh, companies to investigate the supply chains, but going a little bit further than the Modern Slavery Act and giving a platform for victims to sue French companies in French courts. And I'll come on to talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, and, that for, and, and, and allowing for quite large fines, up to 10 million euro fines. So there, there's, there's definitely um, a legislative direction of travel that I think is really uh, exciting. It, it, it has, you know, if you think about when that started, which was really only in 2000. And, eight, nine, uh, we've, we've, we've seen less than a decade, and actually the progress that's been made has been quite astonishing. So that is a reason to be cheerful. However, um, you suspected there might have been a buck coming, and there is. It is my view, and it's not necessarily shared by, by everyone, but certainly uh, given the work that I've done over the last decade or so, which has been largely been in the Middle East and South Africa, in um, East Africa and, and South Asia. My experience tells me that there is still quite a long way to go before we properly translate the progress that we've seen from a policy perspective. Um, we haven't yet seen that translate into practice. And so that is now our challenge, is to find a way of bridging that gap. And you know, there are all sorts of organizations, um, whether they be NGOs, whether they be governments, um, commercial organizations, uh, committed individuals, philanthropic groups, who are doing some amazing work in this space. I'm not going to, to mention them, but you'll, you'll know who I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, there, there is, there is a, a real commitment towards bridging this gap, making it more difficult for the bad guys to do what they do, making it easier for the good guys to do what they do. And that, you know, in very basic terms, that's the mission. But, you know, in order to, to, to get there, we need the help of the general public, frankly. And if you skip to the bottom of that slide that I've, I've marked up as an effective change agenda, you'll see the open question there, which is, do people really care, <clears throat> really care about modern slavery? Uh, I think the evidence is that they, they do. Um, how much they care is sort of related to the question directly above that, which is, you know, do we prioritize the issue of cheap food, cheap clothes, cheap utility bills over the rights of vulnerable workers worldwide? Um, that's an open question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think there is an answer to it, but it's certainly something we need to keep an eye on. Um, you know, working backwards up this slide, you know, what, what does the fact that the that Primark saw their sales increase after their much publicized involvement with the Rana Plaza disaster, what does that tell us about the public's attitude to, to modern slavery? Um, just, just pausing there for a second, Christina said in her introduction that she was working with some, do some outreach uh, work with schools. Um, I, I'm currently teaching a course as part of a program called the Brilliant Club which is a UK-based, uh, um, in fact, just, just gone into the US, but it, it's a primarily UK-based um, outreach program for PhD and other um, research students to go into local schools and to teach a program related to their research. Now, um, I'm teaching a group of 14 and 15-year-olds about modern slavery. The course is entitled, How Do We Solve the Problem of Modern Slavery? And I look at three specific potential levers of change, which I'm, I'm very much sort of 
replicating in this in this talk today around um, the law, corporate reputation, and uh, technology. And, and and it's been really heartening for me to see the reaction of the students to uh, to, to to what I'm teaching them. They they will have, uh, they they did not know anything about any of this before we started. Uh, they hadn't really given it any thought. And in, in a matter of a few weeks, they've really picked up and run with uh, these, these, these subjects, these quite difficult topics. Uh, and they're coming back to me with some really interesting ideas about how we might develop some technology, for example, around um, what I call Zap apps, you know, ways of, of, of getting your mobile phone to, to look at a, at, a, at a product and tell you immediately um, through a hash code or some other form exactly what the human rights um, impact of that company is. And, and I, I have been studying a, um, a website which you, you may be interested in if, if you haven't seen it already, uh, which was um, designed by Oxfam in conjunction with a number of uh, uh, multinational companies. Yeah, it's called Behind the Brands. And you can go onto that website, you can identify a brand and from a, a, a relatively limited number of, of human rights criteria, you can, you can understand what that organization is doing in relation to, say, gender rights, workers' rights, water rights, land rights, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very cool uh, website, and, and the kids really enjoyed looking at it. Uh, uh, but it sort of sparked their interest in how we can develop some, some, some other tools, some more kind of user-friendly tools that will hopefully um, take this message in, into, into a, a greater sort of public consciousness, because as I say on the slide there, you know, Qatar, the Qatar World Cup in 2022 is something that has been on the front pages of the newspapers, certainly in this country, I, I, I'm not sure about the US or, or mainland Europe, but certainly in this country, The Guardian, in conjunction with Humanity United and others, have, have been running quite an effective campaign. Um, Amnesty, I know, have been doing a lot of work. My friend, Mr. Bacadre, has been doing some good work on this. Um, and it is clear, it couldn't be clearer what is going on at the, uh, on the construction sites for the Qatar 2022 World Cup. It is, it is dem demonstrable <laughs> that there is that, that widespread modern slavery abuses, and yet nothing much seems to happen. And it, it, you know, on one level, you can argue that um, the Qataris have actually changed a great deal. And, and I think we have to recognize that that is true. In the, in, the, in the very short period of time that we've seen um, in, in the build of, of, of the stadiums, for example, the, the attitude of the Supreme Committee and, and, and those around them has really gone through a major evolution. Uh, and things like the kafala system, which uh, have, has been in place for, for centuries and which is essentially legalized slavery, uh, is now, or looks like it's now about to be consigned to the dustbin. That would be an extraordinary move forward. But yet, we still see hundreds of thousands of vulnerable South Asian workers being abused um, in, in Qatar, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and one has to question the um, willingness and ability of um, governments, multinational um, companies, NGOs and others to, to change this because we are what we're really talking about here is an ecosystem of corruption and abuse and exploitation and it's one that's been in place for hundreds of years it is deeply ingrained in many of the societies that we work in and it's incredibly difficult to overturn so that is all a bit depressing and I'm sorry about that but it, that is the reality that is not to say that there, are, there, are, there aren't things that we can do. And I, I'm convinced that there are a number of things we can do. One of the lessons that I, I learned from the experience of co-founding and, and working within FSI for a number of years was that if you focus on a problem, a very specific problem, and go in and try and solve that problem and, and, and resource it properly and capacity build as far as you possibly can around that small problem, then you create a bigger solution. And then you learn from that solution and you take the lessons and you move on. So I, I do believe that there are things we can do. And if I move on to the next slide, I'm gonna to start to talk a little bit about how we might do that. So there are 
two major levers of change I'm going to focus on now. One is the law and one is technology. And you'll see on this slide that I refer to something called angel litigation. Now that's my, my phrase, slightly clunky, I apologize for it, but it, it's a way of trying to capture what it is that we're trying to achieve here. Now along with another, uh, well, a group of other lawyers, investigative journalists um, and others, we've been looking for some time at the, the potential for bringing claims in the UK against parent organizations of uh, subsidiary companies that are operating in places like the Middle East and South Asia, where there are endemic modern slavery and other abuses. Now, for years, without wishing to turn this into Law 101, which I don't think anybody wants, uh, for years, it's been the case that certainly in the UK, it was very difficult to bring um, vicarious liability cases. In other words, to sue uh, one company for the actions of another. The corporate veil is something that has, has been drawn over those proceedings. And effectively, um, it, it, it's very difficult to blame the directors of company A for the uh, wrongdoing of directors of company B. But there are signs that the cracks might be appearing a little bit in the corporate veil there because um, some of you may be aware of a case from 2012 called Chandra and Cape, which uh, without boring you the details, essentially Mr. Chandler had um, uh, mesothelioma resulting from asbestosis, which was caused by some work that he did in the 1950s for a company called Cape Products, which was owned by a company called Cape PLC. And the issue at stake was whether or not Cape PLC could be held liable for the failure of Cape products to prevent Mr. Chandler from falling ill. The judgment in the case is quite interesting because it, it holds that, yes, in certain circumstances, a parent company can and should be held liable for the wrongdoing of a subsidiary. Um, it was important in that, that case because Cape PLC uh, was and is a large, wealthy organization. Cape products have long since ceased to exist. And so they were the only, the only entity against whom Mr. Chandler or his estate could move. Um, and, and that principle arising from Chandler and Cape, that there are circumstances in which it's, it's reasonable to bring cases against um, parent companies for subsidiary company wrongdoing, has caught the ear and the eye of lawyers who are thinking, OK, well, what if we were to bring cases against uh, companies for their failings or failing to their subsidiaries in places like Qatar. Um, and those of you who have been watching carefully may have seen a case called Vedanta, uh, which is a case brought by um, quite a famous law firm in the UK called Lee Day on behalf of 1,800 Zambian farmers whose land was um, uh, fairly comprehensively polluted by, by, by uh, a subsidiary of the Vedanta Mining Company. And the question in that case is very similar. Uh, to what extent can it be said that the uh, parent company should be held liable for the actions of the subsidiary? That, that case is currently under appeal. The initial decision to allow the, the case to go to a full hearing is currently under appeal. Um, there is another case I haven't mentioned there called um, AAA and Unilever, in which case, uh, which is a, a Kenyan tea uh, uh, case which was decided the other way, which is also being appealed. So in essence, the law is in a good deal of flux in this, case, in, in this particular um, area. We're likely to see uh, the Supreme Court, um, or certainly the Court of Appeal, maybe even the Supreme Court ruling on these issues later this year or next year. So we'll get a bit more clarity. But the, the idea effectively is that the companies and uh, governments indeed have a responsibility to protect. Now that is a a concept that should be very familiar, I'm sure, to most of you, especially those of you who've read John Ruggie's book, um, uh, which you know, outlines the, 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 the build-up to the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend you do. Um, but this, this idea of the responsibility to protect, which was a, um, a concept that's, that's been around for a number of years in a number of different um, guises, which certainly um, looked like taking off in the international law field a few years ago, um, particularly around the time that, the, that NATO um, intervened in Kosovo 
uh, in uh, 1998. That sort of marked the high water point of, um, uh, of R2P in, in the international law section. But what we're now seeing is enterprising lawyers thinking about how we might try and use the law as a lever of change by essentially causing larger, um, rich Western companies to take more interest in, to police more carefully the supply chains that ultimately they benefit from, um, that, that, that feed up to their, 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 their revenues um, in the West. I, and it, I think it, it can be fairly said that it is no longer uh, acceptable for a large corporate that has its logo and, 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 um, and presence banded about all over uh, parts of the Middle East and South Asia, for them to then say, I'm sorry, it's nothing to do with us, when it's discovered that there are industrial levels of slavery or abuse happening. We don't think that's, that's acceptable anymore. I don't think that the companies, most of the companies, no longer accept that that, 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 that can be a, a way to do business. And actually, what this is all about is creating a level playing field as between businesses that are uh, prepared to abide by the law and businesses who are not. And for a long time, businesses who are not prepared to abide by the law, who do gain a competitive commercial advantage from availing themselves of slavery practices, for example, um, have got away with it. And we need to make sure that they get away with it no more. So there we are. That's one potential lever of change. The next slide, I'm going to talk very briefly about technology as a lever of change. And after that, I've got a few co uh, concluding remarks, and I promise I will shut up shortly thereafter. So you'll have to listen to me no more, um, unless you have any questions, which I'll be very happy to take. But so uh, Christina kindly mentioned earlier that I, I, I have, um, amongst other things, uh, a, 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 um, I'm a partner in a small new technology startup called Treble Partners which you can find out about at treblepartners.com, which is looking to develop uh, a combination of uh, technological approaches to modern slavery. And these are quite targeted interventions, which try to marry a combination of what we call high-tech and low-tech solutions. Now, um, amongst the low-tech solutions, there are a number of... Uh, ideas, um, protocols, um, um, sort of entrepreneurial uh, um, attempts to, to, to generate change that will be very familiar to, to all of you. They usually sit around things like payment and grievance mechanisms. The, the idea of a text message reporting service is one that's been around for a number of years. It hasn't been well used, if I'm honest, uh, to date. Um, but there have been various organizations that have sought to try to connect with vulnerable workers and say, you know, tell us if you've been the subject of abuse, if you've had to pay large sums of money in um, uh, fees or in bribes, or if you're being exploited in other ways. The problem is that until such time as you have generated sufficient trust in that system, it's going to be a big leap of faith for any abused or vulnerable worker to use such a system because they are already um, living within a really difficult situation. They are probably in debt to a, um, an individual or a, or a company that may not necessarily be very kind. Um, that company may very well know where they or their family lives. And so the idea of putting your head above the parapet and being prepared to be the one that complains about that is um, quite a stretch. So when we talk about these sorts of low-tech interventions, we need to make sure, and you'll see it's on the, on the side there, that we combine it with a number of things. And two things are really important. The first is very, very good human ground source intelligence, telling you exactly what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And the second is cultural change and capacity building. And if you don't have a cultural change program, then you're not really addressing the problem because, you know, um, in and of itself, a text message reporting service is just a sticking plaster. If you can combine that with real capacity building, real empowerment, particularly, for example, around gender equality, which we, we're working on currently in a, in a project in India, um, you empower the, the, you know, the women, a very large number of, something like 80% of garment uh, workers in Bangladesh are, are women. 
So, you know, there's a, there's a huge piece to be done around um, you know, gender empowerment and making sure that women feel uh, safe and comfortable in the working environment. When you do that, you start to build an element of trust. And so, you know, things like the text message reporting service then become more, more important. And if you can combine those with, for example, a training program or a way of encouraging workers to see themselves um, as at the beginning of a development program where they can train, where they can learn a, a new skill, you can tell them how much extra they'll earn for having that new skill, etc. Then you start to generate a, a um, what we call a with the grain uh, process. So um, companies, you know, need to be incentivized to use these sorts of systems. Uh, the, the, the workers themselves often do have an incentive to want to, to engage with systems that will help them. But if you just present it to a company as saying, I want you to fill out a form which tells us about your gender balance in your, um, in your factory or your, you know, what you're doing to support women in the, in, in the workplace, then they're going to see it simply as a cost center, potentially as a piece of sort of post-colonial interference in their business, and they're not really going to want to do it. So what you need to do, it seems to me, is combine commercially useful data with data that is going to provide and generate real change in the rights and uh, sustainability agenda. If you can do that, then you're into something that I think is sustainable and which can generate real and sustainable change. Uh, one other quick mention of that is the, the, the cashless payments uh, systems, which are now quite common, the um, uh, Vodafone's m -Pesa system and others uh, are are, are very good ways of taking cash out of the system. You'll all be familiar with the fact that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the corruption, the bribery, the intimidation that goes on around modern slavery is, is all pervasive. And so if you can do one thing, take cash out of the system, then you will um, have an, an immediate and significant impact. I'm just going to tell you one very quick story around that, which is that the um, Afghan National Police, I think, uh, maybe in the ANA, but I, th I think it was the police, recently were transferred onto a cashless payment system where they were paid by their mobile phones. And they all, to their great credit, put their hands up on the first day to say that they'd been, paid, they'd been overpaid. Um, and it turned out that, in fact, they'd been paid the right amount, but they weren't being skimmed off for 30% by the labor agents, which is what had been happening to date. So that gives you an idea of what is possible in the low tech. I shan't talk too much about the high tech stuff. Um, I think others will be giving more interesting talks around that, but there are some amazing uh, things going on around blockchain, around um, artificial intelligence and big data, around machine learning. All this stuff is amazingly good fun. Um, it's potentially transformative. It very much comes from the top of the supply chain rather than the bottom. Uh, but I think if you marry the idea of a, of a, of a whiz bang clever AI ML system with a low tech um, uh, grievance and, and payment system at the bottom, then you're starting to, to work towards something that's actually really exciting, really transparent, really uh, effective. So um, yeah, that's the sort of thing that we're working on there. And we've got some interesting um, uh, work coming up. Now, um, as I said in that slide, I've said previously, you know, this is working in the teeth of some major opposition. And one thing I will be um, pleading with you about is for uh, more young, dynamic, educated, interesting people to get involved in this fight, because we do have quite a lot of opposition. That opposition is armed and dangerous. Um, they've shot at me a few times. And you know they, they, they control a lot of politicians. They control a lot of um, financing. They are essentially in control of a highly um, sophisticated and abusive ecosystem that stretches across many parts of the world. So we have a big job on our hands. However, for my final slide, I do want to leave you with the thought that there are reasons to be hopeful. And that if we, if we keep up the pressure on the government to not only continue the agenda that they have already set for themselves, but, but also, and importantly, to live by their own values and rules. And my PhD actually, which has slightly changed from the title that Christina read out earlier, uh, is focusing on how government money, public money, is often used to, um, un unwittingly perhaps, but certainly used 
um, to reinforce networks of slavery and exploitation when it should not be, and it and it and it needn't be, uh, but for the fact that government uh, as well as commercial organisations tend to be very poor at policing their supply chains. My final point, and I promise this is my final point. I can hear the sighs of, um, of, uh, of relief. My final point is that we need to tell better stories. We need, to, we need to make sure this agenda isn't just dry facts and figures. It's not seen to just be the usual suspects of sandal wearing um, hippies getting very upset about things. You know, we need a real entrepreneurs, people who see their job as doing good and doing well at the same time, who do not see any difference, any distinction between the idea of being wealthy and ethical. Those two things can and should be the same. You know, you're going to hear some fantastic work from, from Anna in a moment about her, um, her operation and the, uh, the attempt to clean up the, the internet. Now, there is so much that we can be doing and, and should be doing that is hugely rewarding, not just with a warm, fuzzy feeling, but the, that is going to be the, the, the industry of the future. So, if you are a student and you are out there and you're thinking of what to do when you, when you graduate, I would implore you to get involved in this fight because we need more people like you and we think we can genuinely change the world. Thank you. James, wow. I, I, I am just so impressed every time um, you speak with just the diversity of your background, but not only your background, but of approaches and the innovations that you've created. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you also for your comments around um, uh, public policy um, as well. I think that's a really important uh, area that we, we need to address when we're thinking about business and human rights and entrepreneurship. And, and I think you did a great job in marrying um, the two ideas of, of public policy and how that in, the two ideas of public policy and entrepreneurship and how that all relates in this um, entire ecosystem of systemic change and and social impact. So uh, with gratitude, and I know that we'll have um, questions for you later. We've had some questions come in already. So uh, thank you again for um, your wonderful presentation. I just want to remind the audience that. We have two more speakers coming. Please send in your questions as soon as you think of them. Uh, we're tracking the questions, and we're going to get to all of them, um, or as many of them as we can get to in the time that we have um, after the final uh, speaker. So do send them into the text chat box, um, and we'll get to them uh, during our Q&A portion shortly. So now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Josiah Carter. And I thought Josiah's story was really important to tell on this webinar when we're talking about entrepreneurship and human trafficking uh, because he was like so many of you who are students right now who are on this call, and I know we have many students who are um, from a variety of universities globally. Uh, when you're thinking about how do you get into this field um, and you're sitting in a classroom and you're hearing, um, you know, people talk about this idea of entrepreneurship and starting a business and et cetera, well, Josiah was somebody who was sitting um, at, you know, at a university, was a student, and had an experience of profound change, which launched um, his nonprofit that he's going to talk about today, um, and how he is working in, in the fight against human trafficking. Uh, so he has a degree uh, in accounting and finance from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, USA, where he resides with his wife and two daughters. Uh, and he is also CPA and works as a manager of finance for a renewable energy company. And then um, he runs his nonprofit, uh, which was where he first um, got the idea to create this nonprofit, uh, was in 2008 during a college mission trip in the capital city of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, he was, um, like other American students who were engaged with different N NGOs, um, including particularly Hope for Children in Ethiopia, where they were learning about what was on the ground, what were the needs of the community, um, and what resources could could he impart um, with his knowledge base um, and his interest and his passion in the fight against human trafficking. So in 2010, along with his wife Megan um, and Autumn Rubke, he founded uh, Base of Threads Foundation. Uh, and this organization has provided a sustainable future for nearly 120 beneficiaries formerly entrapped in slavery, 100% of their product sales go towards the rescue of those who are in slavery. 
And it's the idea of a simple product like a scarf, uh, a world can be changed. And I, and I think that um, his story is so great um, because he has found a way that, that combined his passion um, with entrepreneurship uh, in the fight against trafficking. And I'm just so thrilled that he can be um, here with us today. So Josiah, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Have you uh, passed the ball over to me? Yes, you have the ball. Perfect. You're all set. It, it's such a pleasure to be able to present today, tell you a little bit more about our organization, the work we do, and then kind of a, about the story of how we got started. So Bait the Threads, really our goal is to bring redemption and freedom to people that are enslaved uh, by bringing rehabilitation, job training, and a really sustainable future. Uh, we support organizations and former slaves by bringing their products to the marketplace. Really, the idea here um, is we're partnering with an organization called Hope for Children in Ethiopia, based about out of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It's a city of about 5 million people. They are doing the amazing work of addressing the issue of modern-day slavery, and part of their programming includes teaching people how to make different products. We buy those products, sell them in the U.S., and send 100% of the profits back to rescue more people. So really what we're doing here is the idea of social entrepreneurism, where we're, we're addressing a social issue through business. Particularly, we're able to support organizations that are addressing the issue and, and being able to bring products to the marketplace to help them. For us specifically, it allows us to uh, increase income for those organizations that might need uh, more resources and capacity, as well as bring awareness to the issue itself. For us, kind of from a business perspective, the idea of what we're doing also creates a competitive advantage. As people become more socially aware about the products they buy, uh, for example, James mentioned the um, behind the brands. This is the area where I can say with great confidence that 100% of our product goes to helping people. And that in itself allows us to sell our product at a higher price or be more competitive against products that are similarly priced. So it's a competitive advantage. We can also do the idea of combining a donation as well as a good within a single transaction. Sometimes it's challenging as a nonprofit just to ask for a check. However, if I can embed a donation in with a product, it's an easier ask to convince you to buy a product. The other aspect of what we're doing is looking at the skill sets there on the ground in those cultures that we're helping uh, resource, taking those skill sets and identifying products that we can help sell here in the U.S. or in the Western cultures um, that are valued. Uh, the next slide kind of shows our, our main product. Um, so we, we sell different scarves that are made by people that we've helped rescue. And so they come in a variety of colors, patterns, and we're actually moving this fall into some leather products. Um, that we're excited about that's going to be kind of that next level of products to uh, bring into the marketplace. One of the other aspects of what we do for work is the idea of moving people that are socially minded consumers from, uh, from just consumers to donors. So we've had so many people that have bought a scarf or a product and said, I want to do more than just that. And so we kickstarted this idea of a sponsorship particularly focused around slavery. So you're able to either sponsor people, um, these young kids that they're going to be the next generation of people that fall into slavery, forced prostitution, or you can actually fund um, the rescue of a woman that's currently in prostitution, forced prostitution. The way we really focus on it is um, a very high level return. The donations we receive directly back to our partner organization, as well as being able to uh, have people engage at a very small incremental level. The idea there was that we want people as young as middle school and high school students to understand that they can make a large impact with the funds that they have at hand. And so next I'm gonna kind of talk high level about our, our partner organization, and then I'll get into kind of how we got started. So our partner organization, Hope for Children Ethiopia, has been around for 15 years. Um, they are uh, a group of Ethiopians that understand their culture, understand the issue intricately in a way that I, I won't be able to. And we fund their programs that are focused on rescuing people of different forms of forced labor and prostitution, as well as their programming, addressing the underlying issues and preventative programming. Most of their programming um, around these issues looks like a year-long program in different forms. Um, it uh, provides basic needs for this year-long program and focuses a lot around counseling. These individuals that are being rescued, in essence, have had their self-value uh, broken. They've been told that they're worthless, that, that their only value is to be uh, a slave. And so building in that inherent value that they are worth something, that they should have dreams and hopes for their future. 
as well as healthcare um, literacy and basic education and life skill training that they didn't receive because they didn't have that network of individuals around, around them as they were growing. And really the next aspect of that year-long program is creating a sustainable future for them. So they get the opportunity to choose between different job training skills and by the end of the program, um, they go through an exam and get a government certificate showing that they are skilled in that area. There's an internship and job placement program um, that gives them that strong job that they never have to worry about a sustainable income and the opportunity to be at risk of falling into this issue again. As well as there's been a large number of people that we've been able to help them kickstart their own business, which has been amazing to see people that go from being sweatshop workers, being forced to work so many hours a day, to now owning their own business and running it and having ownership over what their future looks like. Just to put this kind of in a picture perspective, just to give a little bit more information. So a lot of the women that we're helping rescue in this large city are being um, prostituted out of this area called South Mikado. It's an entire district. And those women that are being rescued get the opportunity to choose between French cooking lessons, um, where they get the opportunity to go into four-star hotels in the city or to become hairdressers, and that's a huge part of their culture is hairdressing and um, beautician. So it's an amazing opportunity for them as they go through that program. For those that are stuck in sweatshops, and you can see a picture there on the left of a sweatshop, that are being forced to work 14, 15 hours a day, six days a week. When they get rescued, they get the opportunity to go through a program where they actually become um, master weavers. So they're taught all the different technical skill sets around weaving, a wide variety of designs, um, and they learn they learn how to make scarves, blankets, um, dresses, and they really become a, a master of that skill set for something that was once just used against them. And these students, when they end the program, get seed money to start their own business. And it, it's been amazing to see um, where these uh, students go. So really, the last part of what, what I want to share today is kind of how we get started. And so um, in 2008. Um, I was a, a student at Drake University in accounting and finance. At this point, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about modern day slavery. Um, and, and it wasn't something that was talked about at that point. And so I got invited to spend the summer um, working in an NGO in the capital city. I was teaching geography. I also didn't know anything about Ethiopian geography. But uh, I was there for the summer and some of my classmates that were with me were actually working with Hope for Children in Ethiopia, focusing on the women and their job training and their, their counseling program. And near the end of that program, they invited those uh, American students to go see the prostitution where the district where these women had been rescued from. So that night they went out and they came back and they shared their stories describing in detail that district. And I remember hearing them describe this area that went block after block of these young women being prostituted um, for 25, 50 cents, maybe a dollar per transaction. And I was just, I was broken by this. I, how could it be that I didn't know anything about this issue and nobody was talking about it? And then I, I asked the question, if this was my sister or my niece or one of my friends, what would I do to prevent this from happening from the, to them? Or really the answer came back, I, I would do anything. So why, why wouldn't I do the same for these women? And so I come back, um, I finish up my senior year and during my senior year, uh, we ordered 40 scars from this organization just thinking that maybe we could do something little. And so we, we set up a college stand and we sold those 40 scars and they sold out in about a half hour. And that became the light switch for this idea that maybe we could do something through business. So I graduate, get married, and two years later, after telling my wife and that the story's nonstop, we go back over to Ethiopia, we sit down with the director from Hope for Children, and he tells us everything about their programs and the amazing sustainable programming that they're doing and we finished it, the conversation with, I brought $1,000 with me, and this is our deal. We want to buy your products and sell them and send you all the profits back. So I walked back into the U.S. with two suitcases full of scarves, uh, smuggling them across the border, never, never being more scared in my life than that. We didn't have a name. We didn't have a, uh, really a business plan or a board or anything, and we started from there. And over the last seven years, we've grown. We've got a team of volunteers, and those 175 scarves, have translated into us selling over 12,000 scarves. And those 12,000 scarves have helped us um, fund the, the prevention, the rescue over 120 people, as well as we're about to send in the funding for another 20 people. And so that small step of getting engaged has translated into 140 people 
having their lives change in the generations uh, from them uh, to having a bright future that's sustainable and never have to worry about being trapped in uh, modern slavery again. And at this point, Christina, I'll pass it back to you uh, to, uh, to share the video of the stories of the women that we've, uh, we've helped work with and engage with. Thank you so much, Josiah. Thank, and thank you for your great work. Um, Zach, do we want to um, cue the video up? Of course, the video for this, let me just go ahead and copy and paste this link. It is going to show up in the chat. To all participants. So what we're going to do so um, for our audience, because of the way the, the webinar works and everyone is participating from different web browser speeds, um, we're just, we're just going to ask um, you to take a few minutes to watch this video. Um, it's no longer than three minutes uh, from Josiah, which gives a personal story about, about the work that Basis Threads is, is doing in Ethiopia. So for, you'll see that uh, link in the text chat box right now. So Josiah, I think it's been about three minutes. Did you want to add any final comments um, to the video? Yeah, really the last thing I'd say is um, it, it's really those small steps of getting engaged um, that you college students can, can be a part of the next generation, whether it's through the work that James is talking about or even on a very micro perspective. And so those one or two people that you might engage with and change their lives, I can tell you that their worlds will be changed again, all changed forever. Or if you're able to make a larger impact, those people that you engage with, um, it will mean a world of a difference. So thank you for uh, the work that you're doing, Christina, to uh, make this awareness uh, with your college. Thank you so much, Josiah, and thank you for sharing your really personal story uh, about how you started this organization. I, I, I know that every um, speaker on this webinar is going to have a different perspective, and, it, and it's fantastic because it, um, it, it brings home about how everyone can come to entrepreneurship in a different way, and, and I think it's really important to share that. So, um, so Josiah, thank you for, for the work that you're doing and you can continue to do and, and for sharing this really eloquent story with us. So now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next speaker, um, Anna uh, Borgstrom, uh, who we're delighted to have with us today, uh, who is the director and head of NetClean. She has an amazing um, background. She's worked with organizations and governments worldwide since 2009. 
uh, to combat online child sexual exploitation through introducing and lobbying for the uptake of new and leading technical solutions which work to save children from harm. And, and NetClean is, is a part um, of this work and she's gonna tell us more about uh, her organization. So I don't wanna um, go too much into detail with that because I want her to be able to share this. Um, but she's also a member of the Safer Society Group Management Team, which develops and drives companies that specialize in technology with the aim of creating a better and safer society by tackling societal problems through IT solutions. NetClean is actually one of these um, subsidiaries, and I'm sure she's going to tell us more about that too. Um, she has a bachelor degree in computer science and economics, and she's worked with innovative solutions within the telco and IT industry for 20 years. Uh, she has throughout her career built her leadership skills with the aid of distinctive leadership programs, and she possesses extensive uh, international experience from sales and business development. Uh, she has also managed large cross-cultural customer products with cross their complexity and secured quality and delivery to international telecom operators, multinational companies, and government organizations. And she's also, uh, amazingly, she is a former professional female football player. Uh, so she brings this experience and, and she worked on the national team um, in order to really empower uh, women and girls. Um, and, and particularly young women um, because of this, this experience she's had as a professional football player. Um, she's also involved in Tolo IF, the largest youth football club in Western Sweden where she is a member of the board. Uh, and she's taken on specific responsibility to develop strategies to create a positive sporting environment where children between the ages of eight, and f eight to 15 years of age can feel safe, enjoying themselves and develop both as football players but as individuals. She's also a head coach um, for girls. Um, and in her leisure time, uh, she spends, enjoys spending time with her husband and two daughters. She also has an interest in health and uh, photographing nature, um, uh, outdoor photographing. And uh, she also uh, is passionate about yoga. So Anna, we are just so excited to have you and, and to hear the net clean story. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So. Uh, you are the presenter now. Okay, great. Oops. Where is my presentation? Oh, it's it's right at the end there in the tab that says net clean. Yeah. Do you want me to put it up for you? Yes, please. Can you I'll do put that? it up for you. I don't see how to. That can you um just um put the the presentation up for Anna? That's probably easier. Yeah, I'll just make my Thank you, Zach. presenter. All right, are you guys seeing net clean now? Yes, yes. we are. Perfect. So I just click on the next button. page then. Yes, okay. now you're the presenter okay. again. So if you just click on the little right arrow in the top left, um, that'll take you to the next page. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for uh, having me as a speaker in this, uh, in this context. Uh, James and Joshua, wow, uh, you are heroes in my, in my eyes. Um, well, Netlin, um, Netlin is part of Safe Society Group and was actually the first company in that group. And uh, we, are, we are niched, we are focusing on child sexual abuse uh, content uh, and finding them online in different ways. Um, <clears throat> uh, we are a Swedish based company and we come, see if I can just click here. Yeah. Uh, we come from the west coast of Sweden in a town, in a town called Gothenburg. Uh, it's, the, it's the second largest town in Sweden. Um, I'm not sure what you, what you know about Sweden, but my experience from traveling abroad is that uh, Sweden is seen as a liberal country in many ways by people from other countries, especially when, when it comes to freedom of speech and privacy, but also when it comes to sex. Uh, child sexual abuse, or CSA, um, was legal in Sweden, Sweden during the 70s and was sold openly uh, in the shops, actually. In the 80s, it became illegal to distribute child sexual abuse, but also to produce if the intention was to distribute. And it was not until 1999 it became illegal to possess child sexual abuse images. And uh, 2010, it became e illegal to, to view child sexual abuse material. So when, when uh, James was talking about uh, uh, two levers of, uh, of change, one law and one uh, 
techni technology, I would say that applies very well to, to NetClean. Uh, NetClean was founded in 2003. Uh, and remember, it was not until 1999 it became illegal to possess child sexual abuse images. Uh, and what, what happened in 2003 was that uh, um, Christian Bay, uh, one of our phone founders and, and CEO, CEO of Safe Society Group, he read in the paper that police during an investigation came across uh, more and more child sexual abuse material and that the human eye had to look at every picture during the categorization and victim identification process. Um, the article in the magazine also said that these images were stored in a database. And Christian thought that if the police store images that are already being processed, why not develop a tool that can sort out the already processed and known images so that the police officer can focus on the new stuff. Uh, <clears throat> that was that tool is called uh, Griffi Analyze today and is in our sister company Griffi. And now it's now being used by 3,000 law enforcement agencies around the world. Uh, and uh, and Griffi has continued to build on the tool and now they offer the market several collaboration tools uh, to the law enforcement community. And uh, they have customers like Europol, Interpol, Home Office, uh, NCA in the UK and Homeland Security and the FBI in the US, to name a few that are using these solutions to, to, to in an efficient way collaborate uh, with the purpose of speeding up victim identification and more and more children are, are identified and rescued from abuse. I think that uh, last year uh, more than 1,600 children were rescued with help of those tools. So it's really, really efficient. Uh, Netlin uh, offers premier te technology solution that finds the, the dissemination of online child, child sexual abuse. And uh, we still have the collaboration uh, with law enforcement agencies as we did uh, in the beginning. Uh, and, they, and we have together with law enforcement built uh, the tools that are used within the Netlin company today. And those tools are targeting um, uh, enterprise companies uh, and ISPs. So um, back in 2003 or four or five, I think it was now, um, Christian and his team uh, went to the Swedish police and developed uh, the products that are not now used in different ways to detect and block child sexual abuse. Um, <clears throat> Since 2003, uh, we have deepened our collaboration with law enforcement and NGOs. And the recent years, we can also see an increase in collaborations driven by the industry and the UN sustainability goals. Uh, child sexual exploitation, exploitation is something that finally has been raised on the political again, agendas all over the world. And many organizations are doing a lot to make sure that the, their services are clean from child sexual abuse content. Um, we can see that through our customers, uh, we have an installed base uh, while all over the world. I think we have more than one million licenses or endpoint uh, computers that are protected by our systems. Um, and when we talk about collaboration, um, we can see a huge positive impact that a company can have on society and on abused and exploited children's lives because when, when an alarm is triggered in a corporate environment, for example, uh, an investigation um, or a verification of an alarm, uh, the, company, the company do a verification of, an, of the alarm and uh, often they report to police and the police starts an investigation. And uh, we have seen many times that children can actually be rescued from, a, from an abused situation by that. So, if, if more and more uh, are taking um, care of their own services, you know, you read in the paper that Google and Facebook and all the big players are doing a lot uh, to, to uh, make sure that their services are clean from child sexual abuse. And that's fantastic. Um, but if you think of it, when you upload a picture on the, on the internet, you, you lose control of it. And it's the same with the child sexual abuse content. Um, and this is because of the complexity from a technical view. Um, 
because before you can count to three, I would say that the image has been uploaded and downloaded uh, more times that you can count, and somewhere it's landed in, on some someone's computer or hard drive, uh, which means that uh, when Facebook and Google and uh, and uh, those are taking care of their services, they work in silos. So what we need to do is to find technology that that gets uh, closer to to the actually. Uh, source, which in this case is the distributor, and, and that's really hard to do. Um, <clears throat> so there is no easy, there is no easy solution for, for this uh, this problem because it's so complex. And another thing is also how the internet is is built uh, on all the different layers, and uh, it makes it quite hard to to. Uh, um, to detect and block on on high speed traffic, and and also you have the uh, the uh, uh, the problem with encryption, uh, where you are not allowed to, where you can't uh, you can't uh, analyze the the traffic because of, of the nature of encryption. Uh, so we have a lot of um, obstacles to fight to fight in order to solve the problem. However. Um, <clears throat> What we can do is to is to tackle the, the problem in, in, in different layers. Uh, so when we when we talk about uh, um, our with our customers about our, our technologies, we divide uh, the problem of child sexual abuse into three different layers. Um, on the first layer, we have the experimental users. Uh, on the second layer, the addicted users, and on the third layer, the uh, the abusers. So, for instance, the experimental users. These are the ones that are surfing the internet uh, or to look for images. Uh, they have um, maybe a, they are curious about. They have come across a, an image at some point and are curious to, to find more. Uh, here, Google and and uh, the ISPs and the search engines come into to can play a big role when it comes to blocking uh, uh, blocking the images or. Uh, search key uh, databases they can use to stop to stop the search, etc. So we have a product that, a product there called Netlin Whitebox, and uh, uh, we have the two largest uh, ISPs in Sweden, and they have a, a European uh, installations, both of them. And what we, what we can see from their installations is that uh, one in thousand people are searching for child sexual abuse material on the internet. Uh, and Whitebox uh, works that they have in Whitebox. Uh, we get the lists on, on known URLs from law enforcement uh, and Interpol. So if you try to to, uh, to look for for um, an image on on a site that is known, uh, you get blocked. Uh, <coughs> on the uh, on the second level, the the addicted, uh, we have our NetClean Proactive product. That is that is used by governments, multinational companies, uh, uh, and uh, uh, organizations worldwide. And uh, um, that product is installed on on endpoints uh, and on the internet to to save to to, uh, to make sure that uh, company assets are not used to distribute or download child sexual abuse images. What we can see there, and I said before that we have an installed base on, on over a million uh, licenses, and we can see that in a company, one out of 1,000 uh, computers are achieving alarms. And uh, in NetClean Proactive, we use the hash technology. So we get, uh, with the law enforcement collaborations that we have, we get a hash database from, from different uh, law enforcement agencies around the world with hash, hashes of known child sexual abuse images. So it doesn't matter where the where the image are uh, on on the internet, or if it's on a USB stick, or if it's uh, uh, on a hard drive. If it's known, uh, if it has been uh, at some point classified by law enforcement as illegal, we find that image. So corporations they they have approximately one out of a thousand uh, computers that are achieving alarm, and that's that's a low number, I would say actually. Uh, and then on the top we have the abuser, uh, and and uh, here we have our sister company Griffith Analyze. Uh, they uh, 
the law enforcement agencies around the world use the collaborative uh, tool that they that they uh, assist to the market and uh, and that tool is uh, is really a very powerful media and digital media uh, investigation tool and we can also see the collab uh, the correlation that uh, approximately 30% of those who has uh, has uh, interest in child sexual abuse material commit their own physical abuse. And here it's easy to, to think that uh, that if you have a sexual interest in children and, and you want to commit abuse, that you travel abroad. But uh, what we can see is, is that the abuse uh, appears uh, in a close area of, of the abuser. So, um, Especially in a corporate network, we have we have actually found, or the the the, the companies have had employees, uh, and together with the police, they have found children and rescued them from from uh, actually abuse situations. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, see if I can. So NetClean was uh, was one of the first social entrepreneur companies in Sweden, and as uh, James said before. Uh, being good and, and make money at the same time, it's, uh, it's still, in Sweden, we are still a bit immature about that. So uh, for us, we are also trying to, to uh, work against an opposition. Um, and even if we have uh, large companies like IKEA and Ericsson and, and those companies that have a very strong corporate responsibility uh, programs, uh, it's easy, it's I believe it's easier for them to 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 give money uh, abroad than to actually look inside the, their companies, especially when it comes to our subject, because it's still it's still really hard to talk about um, in in a corporation because you don't want to know um, you don't want to know if you have your, an, an, a colleague who has a sexual interest in children. Uh, it's really really um, scaring for them to talk about it. So what we do is that we often need to educate uh, the customers uh, that if they don't have our solution, because there is really no other solution that that, uh, that are targeting the workplace in the way that we do. So if they don't have our solution, they are opening up uh, their company to risk. And uh, the risk can take many forms. Uh, one is that if a company or a couple of thousand employees, uh, they are they are more they are likely to have to have have those uh, illegal pictures circulating their internet or, or on the assets. And if you have a person um, that possesses child sexual abuse, you, that person and, and other people know about that and, and, and they know that he or she is, uh, um, is working on a company and has an executive role, He's, he could be target for, for um, bribe, bribing. Uh, for for more information, but the, but also if you don't know that the, that you have a problem, why should you look for it? And and that's where uh, the code code of conduct and conduct and ethical business uh, um, uh, comes in, um, and that's really a correlation to James' work. Uh, I, I can find that that uh, a lot of the companies that we work with, uh, they they have they have they report that they have uh, um, that they have tools to enforce policy when it comes to child sexual abuse or child sexual exploitation. Um, and companies that are installing our enterprise tool, they can really make a difference. As I said before, alarms triggered can really save children from from abuse and and. Uh, uh, I think that uh, those large companies that we have, uh, they really, really, uh, our installation and, and the way that they um, feel about product, our product and what they do has really, really uh, high, raised their ethical standards. Um, so the workplace is often an arena that are missed in the debates. Um, so we need we need help to actually uh, spread the message. And uh, I was going to send a video here or show a video, but uh, I don't think it worked. So maybe you can help to upload it. I <coughs> I just sent. We a just sent the video, video out. Oh, yep, it should be in the chat box. 
So, so everyone, everyone, go to the text chat box and, and um, see that video um, for your reference either now or later because um, it's a great um, showcase for some of the things Anna is talking about. Yeah. Anna, did you have final comments um, for your presentation? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So, uh, child sexual abuse, it, it's not an easy topic, uh, but what we have to remember is that it happens whether we choose to see it or not. Uh, and I, I'm very humbled that I was given a chance to present to you today. Um, and I want to wish you the best of luck in whatever you, you undertake in life uh, and whatever you do, if you are starting up your own company or if you are going to work in our, in our space, um, do it with passion because it's, it, I think it's worth it. It's worth to, to, have, uh, to drive this, really. It's, it's really, really rewarding. Um, and if you want to learn more about NetClean, what we do, and the complexity around child sexual abuse, uh, please visit our website. I can see that I have misspelled on the slide there, but it's netclean.com. Uh, you can also follow me on, on LinkedIn or, or uh, Twitter, or netclean on Twitter. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for your extraordinary work about a really, really difficult topic. Um, so we just commend you on your efforts and your company, and uh, thank you for sharing your words of wisdom uh, with how you got started, and um, we're so grateful to have you on the webinar today. Thank you. So now we're going to begin. We're, we're, um, we are approaching fastly the, um, the, the, uh, second, um, the, second, the end of the second hour uh, for our webinar today, but we're going to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so what I want to do is first start off with a question for um, all of our speakers to just answer. Um, and some of you, you talked a little bit about this in your presentations, but I think it's important for the audience because I hear so many questions um, all the time, often from students about, you know, again, how do I get started and how does my degree in, in XYZ topic relate to this issue of human trafficking? And, and I was just wondering if um, each of you could just briefly share um, in just a couple minutes of comments, you know, what were the the um, lessons learned that you have from starting um, your businesses and starting your organizations? Were there things that um, were that you would recommend doing, or things that you would not recommend doing? I know that that's always a fun question, but I think it's really important for the audience to hear that. Um, so, whoever would like to start off, um, that would be great. Shall I take someone? James, would you like to start off? I can, I can take the swing of that if you'd like. Um, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> lessons learned. Well, I, I mentioned one of them earlier, which I think is very important, and that is to focus your energies really, um, uh, really tightly on, on a particular thing that you want to, to, to try and solve. Um, that, that's quite a particular remark around um, you know, being a social entrepreneur and, and setting up a business and trying to solve a specific problem. Don't try and change the world all at once, essentially is what I'm saying, because that's impossible and you'll fail. But you might be able to change somebody's world. You know, Josiah was making some really good points. So I found myself nodding in agreement. He's doing some amazing work. Um, and you know, he's picked on a very specific part of the world and a very specific problem, and he's gone and, and done something about that particular problem. And that would be my my main um, piece of advice, I guess. The other thing would be the usual stuff, do, it, do whatever you want to do, but do it with passion. Um, you know, uh, I, I said earlier, I think that you know, the, the way that we, we change the world here is to, is to recognize that doing the right thing and doing well out of it can be and should be the same thing. So I, I would really encourage people who are thinking about getting into this space to try and try and um, think like an entrepreneur uh, and not necessarily like a, uh, not that I have anything against NGOs who do some amazing work, but um, I, I, the thing that really gets me up in the morning is the idea of, a, of re, recasting capitalism, if you want to call it that, in a very grand way. I, I, want, I want to do, um, do good and do well at the same time. And I think that that's something that if we all try and do, 
then we end up repositioning, repivoting the idea of what global capitalism looks like because it doesn't have to be built on um, uh, exploitation or abuse. Um, it doesn't have to be crony capitalism. It doesn't have to be kickbacks and, and, and bribery. You know, it can be collaborative. It can be mutually supportive. Um, it, you know, it, it can be high tech. It, it should be high tech. It should be uh, creative. Um, so, you know, think about how you're going to use all of your talents in um, uh, in, a, in a way that's going to make you money, but also leave a, a really positive social legacy at the same time. Thank you, James. Anna or Josiah, do you have some thoughts on that? I, I can absolutely add on to, to kind of what James was saying there. Um, from a skills standpoint is there's some amazing organizations out there that need a variety of skills. So, for example, on our board, we have accountants. We have one guy that works for Facebook, and he's an Internet engineer. So there's a variety of skills that businesses need. So sometimes it's maybe not starting something new, but identifying an organization that's doing amazing work and asking if there's a way for you to partner with them with your skill sets. In regards to the lessons learned, um, one of the biggest things I'd say is you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have the entire business built on day one. Um, and really what I'd suggest is maybe find a, a umbrella organization that can let you get started um, without trying to get through all the red tape, whether that be a college organization or a church or a company that is willing to let their umbrella organization capture you as you kind of get started in that first year or two gives you that great opportunity to figure out what's going to be successful before you put on the effort into uh, kind of some of the legal headaches of trying to get an organization started. Thank you, Josiah. A Anna, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would like, I, I totally agree with the other two speakers, but uh, um, my comment is listen listen to the right people or or especially more importantly listen to yourself and follow follow your heart and follow what you, what you believe in and it has been uh, we have uh, several times uh, listened to to the more senior people around us that that sort of are experts in uh, in this or that and and we kind of felt some somewhere deep inside us that ah uh, it's not really right but they they probably knew more than we do and we follow their their path, and uh, that has not always turned out so well. So listen to yourself and follow your heart and your passion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I would also just add to that too. I think um, sometimes sometimes um, when you're starting off as an entrepreneur, you you, you can feel defeated um, if something fails. But failure is necessary to get to the other side. And I think. Sometimes I, I think we feel like we have to give up, and when we think of an issue like human trafficking with all of its complexities and all of the different issues that, that go into it and other forms of crime, illicit trade, et cetera, it can be daunting. But I, I would just say to everyone, you know, n do not give up. I, you know, go for a second chance. Go for a third chance. We need everybody to, to be engaged in this field, and, and um, just like um, – James has said about, you know, in commenting on Josiah's work in, in particular, um, you know, Josiah became really versed in one area um, of the world. And starting off with one area, one type of human trafficking, you know, in a region, um, one piece of this issue I think is really important because it can be so overwhelming. Um, and each of the presenters today have, have um, demonstrated that they've brought their own skill set and, and knowledge base, whether it's technology, whether it's the law, uh, et cetera, to uh, the issue of human trafficking. So I think that's really, really important. So um, we have some other questions um, regarding public policy, and I want to merge, merge them together so we can get to them. Um, so James, these were particularly directed at, at your comments. Um, there was a question about, are there elements missing in the California um, and UK Modern Slavery Act that could make it easier um, to further engage with businesses. Um, how do you see also, um, would it also be, are there ways to make it easier to conduct angel litigation? Uh, and there was also a question about, um, is the executive order that was in the previous um, administration in the United States, um, has that been rescinded? And I believe that they're talking about the um, 
I'm assuming the federal contractor um, uh, executive order. Um, and it, in your um, uh, opinion, is that still ongoing? Are you seeing you know, movement with that? So, so James, this is your question. With that one, if I may, uh, in terms of Obama's EXO, as far as I'm aware, it's still in, in, in force. It doesn't really, the, the, the executive order itself is actually not that critical because what happened after that was that a lot of the changes that were announced were then incorporated into the federal acquisition regulations that were revised in 2015. To the best of my knowledge, that, that there's been no talk of replacing or rescinding any of the trafficking in persons regulations. I think it would be incredibly foolish um, for uh, the current administration to try and do any of that. I, I don't see any appetite for it. Um, all of my contacts in Washington tell me that there is something of a rear guard action being fought by a number of agencies and individuals on, on, this, on this front. I don't see, frankly, that the president has any bandwidth to get involved in that. I, I don't expect to see any backsliding on, on issues relating to trafficking persons. Uh, it might happen a bit, but actually, you know, the, the global um, direction of travel in that regard is, is pretty clear. Uh, there might be other consequences from, for example, the, the onshoring of U.S. businesses, which leads to a, a, a lower um, investment um, sort of scenario for, for American business over, overseas. Uh, that's, that's potentially going to have an impact, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't see that the American or indeed the U.K. or European legislative environment is going to get worse for us. I think it might even get slightly better. Uh, on the litigation front, I think that certainly in the UK, we're going to see some very significant developments over the course of the next few months. I'm not sure there's an awful lot that can be done on a on a ground on a grassroots level. I think we're seeing um, I think we're seeing the, the wheels being put in pro process now for for what we want, which is which is to see more big uh, brands taking more responsibility for more of their supply chains. You know, and there are some great examples of some companies, John Lewis, Marks and Spencer, Tesco's and others, who are doing some really good work in this field already. And, and actually, we're, we're, we're working as much on their behalf as on our behalf, because what we all want and what they want is the same thing, which is a level playing field. And we want all businesses to be acting at least within the law, if not going beyond the law and acting more ethically. So watch this space on that. If you keep an eye on, on what's happening in the UK courts, I think we're going to see some some quite interesting responses. The final point about the Modern Slavery Act, the California Act, um, uh, you know, I think it's very much you know wait and see pattern at the moment. Certainly for the Modern Slavery Act, I know that um, the California Act has come in for some uh, criticism. Uh, some of that's fair, some of it isn't. The Modern Slavery Act, uh, uh, the the um, Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner uh, and I have spoken about this a couple of times now, but. Um, I think what's, what's going to happen is you know, the government didn't actually really want to bring in the transparency and supply chains provision, provisions that, that sit within Section 54 of the Act. They were encouraged to do so by, amongst others, people like Tesco and John Lewis, who wanted um, more regulation in this area. It only applies to bigger businesses that turn over more than £36 million. And it only requires them to publish a statement on their website saying that they have looked at their supply chains, it doesn't actually require them to do anything, uh, and there's no penalty for not doing it. Um, uh, you know, to, to comply with the law, all you need to do, technically, is put a one-word statement out saying, we don't have any slavery in our supply chain. As long as it's signed off by a director and it's published on the website, um, that fulfills the criteria. Now, there's a lot of people who, who think that that is insufficiently robust and should be given more teeth by, for example, reading across from Section 7 of the Bribery Act, which contains much more punitive vicarious corporate liability perspectives. But look, I'm getting into some technical stuff here. It's late in the day, so I don't want to go too deep. But yeah, there are ways in which we can we can beef up the Modern Slavery Act. I think that that might happen over the course of the next couple of years, depending on the nature of the political environment. Again, you know, we all live in the, in the sort of meta-political environment here. Brexit is not going to help us. You know, one of the things I'm writing about in my PhD thesis is the fact that if we don't allow uh, or don't require our government agencies and our major companies to act within the law and within our ethical frameworks within the European Union, 
then how can we expect them to be doing so when they're supposed to be going out and banging the drum on behalf of Britain in places like Uzbekistan or um, you know, parts of sub-Saharan Africa? It, you know, it, it's, um, it's something that's, that's a real concern. But we'll see. Um, I think there's, there's more people who are prepared to make more noise about it than there were before, which is great. And we will have to do what we always do, which is hold the government to account and make them responsible for their actions. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I, a lot of uh, answers there from um, two very complex questions, so, so thank you for that. Uh, so this next question is for Josiah. Um, and Josiah, the question is about, um, and I think you covered a bit about this, and I think they're, they're interested in um, just a few more sentences on it. Um, do you see um, the, the basis Reds model at this point looking more at the systemic push and pull factors that lead to the vulnerability for trafficking. I know you mentioned, you know, some of the on the ground work by Hope um, Hope for Children, um, but is there, um, you know, any further conversation of looking at, um, you know, say barriers to education or, or things that are, um, would help in terms of the issue of, you know, economic sustainability um, and the challenges where people do become vulnerable to trafficking. Absolutely. Just to maybe mention a couple of the brief programs our partner organization does address kind of these uh, systemic issues. One is um, generally what happens is um, children and, and teenagers come from the countryside and are trafficked to the city for, for sweatshop work. And so what happens is when somebody is rescued from the program, one of the critical aspects is they actually are taken back to where they came from originally to share their story so that other people know that when a broker comes and says, hey, I'm going to take your child to the city to get them education or job, that they're not telling the truth, that they're actually taking them to be sold. Um, there's that aspect to it. There's aspects uh, of their educating uh, mothers in the countryside and giving them um, sustainable futures and job training. So that way, there's not an issue of their children being at risk of not having the economic needs to go to school, et cetera. So a lot of it focuses addressing uh, the mothers as well as awareness in, in the countryside where the, uh, many of these children come from. Um, in, in the city itself, uh, a lot of the education relies around um, educating people that are buying products from um, sweatshops and they're not aware of it. So making the market aware of this is where products are coming from, this is the area, and you should know that this is made by slave labor and there are opportunities to buy it from people that aren't, um, are more ethical in uh, providing fair wages. Thank you so much, Josiah, um, for, for clarifying that. So this is gonna be the final question, unfortunately, and then we're gonna go to final comments and, and we'll end as close to the end of the second hour as possible. So, so Anna, um, I just wanted to ask you since, um, you are such a pioneer in, in working with um, technology. Are you, do you work with other um, tech entrepreneurs um, in, in Sweden or elsewhere that are, that are coming together um, in terms of the fight against human trafficking? Is that something that, that you're finding? The technology company, I mean, technology companies in general, um, when we look at an industry, we find that there's, there's tremendous work being done. But from an entrepreneur perspective of the single entrepreneur, um, that's working on this, how, how are you finding the collaboration um, and synergies? Yeah, well, I can find, I, I, I think that there are more that can, that can be done in collaboration and, and I can find it quite hard being, being a Swedish company and, and uh, quite small in the context of Facebook and Google and those uh, guys that, that do a lot uh, on their platforms. And um, <clears throat> The collaboration, though, with law enforcement that we have, that's really ex extensive, and uh, and uh, for us, it's very important to have the right to, or to have quality in our uh, in our hash database that that the, the companies are blocking on, because uh, we can't block uh, wrong. Uh, uh, so I think the collaboration between the industry can be can be done. Uh, can we can do more there? Uh, but I also think that this is. This is quite, er we are in a quite early days still, so I am very optimistic. And there are great initiatives, especially from, from the UK, uh, where 
uh, where they are driving um, We Protect that is now merged with the Global Alliance initiative in, in the in the U.S. and and that's uh, that's huge because uh, that's they are enabling a framework for countries how to how to uh, um, combat child sexual abuse and it's uh, it's from the law perspective down to technology so it's it's really really good and we are part of that community so uh, that's that's very positive but uh, as I said it's early days more can be done I think it, I think we always can do more but we also have to to uh, allow ourselves to to look back on on what we have achieved so far um, yeah thank you so much Anna uh, and great question so now we I, it, it always goes, goes by so fast and there's so much more that we can talk about and I know that we'll be um, continuing the conversation in the coming days uh, and so for final comments, I know this is hard because there's so much still to say, uh, words of inspiration. I want to go around uh, our dynamic panel um, and, and if you could give um, two minute comments um, summing up uh, this incredible conversation today uh, and, and what you would like to leave the audience with. And uh, why, don't we, why don't we start with, um, with James. I hope what I've said earlier was interesting. Uh, I, not too much more to say other than, you know, there's, there is plenty of scope here to do some really good stuff. And whatever your background, where, whatever you, whatever you, wherever you start from, you know, there is a, there's a huge sort of playing field out there into which we can, we can move. I will just perhaps leave you with this. You've listed on your slide very kindly some of my qualifications, it might be of interest to some of your students there to know that actually I left school at 16 with no qualifications at all. And it took me a few years to finally realize what I wanted to do and to work my way up to, to doing what I'm doing now. And you know, the, the years in between, I spent largely myself as a vulnerable worker, someone who didn't have any um, economic or uh, other power and so had to essentially um, do what I was told and so in some respects I sort of have a slight empathy with the people that we work with now and the reason for telling you that is just to say that there's really nothing to stop um, any of you doing some great things here uh, you've heard some really inspiring stuff from from Anna and Josiah I think they're both doing fantastic work and you know pick something you're interested in um, go do it and you know, best of luck to you. It's uh, it's a big world out there. Thank you, James. Okay, Josiah. Absolutely. What I'd say is, your talents are your talents are needed uh, to address this issue. Um, no matter what you're studying or focusing on, or your talents are, they're needed um, by organizations, um, and as well as to to do startups. And so. I would say don't let the, the issue, the large, how large it is to be a barrier or the effort it takes to start something to be a barrier. Come alongside other organizations um, that are doing amazing work, um, whether that be with your talents or financially, or take the step out and try to start something. Um, but it's because of your generation that will be able to address this issue on, on a broader scale. So thank you for the opportunity to share today. And uh, it's been great to hear from uh, Anna and James. Thank you, Josiah. And Anna? Yeah. Um, well, be strong uh, because you will meet resistance. Uh, and be proud of what you do uh, because people will not always believe in you, but you have to be proud enough to believe in yourself. Uh, allow yourself to be bright uh, and share your knowledge with others. Uh, follow your heart. And remember why you started. I think those are really important. So good luck and thank you very much for, for having me here. It's, uh, I'm really, really humbled about it. And, uh, and uh, James and Josiah, your, your uh, great, great presentations. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It, it's, it's just amazing to be able to follow up with all of you. I'm humbled um, by your work and, and for being able to, 
share um, this time with you. So, so thank you for your contributions to the field and for being such inspiration for all of us. And I just want to leave the audience, and, and I know we talked a lot about, too, about students, but we also have, um, you know, mid-career professionals and, um, and, and people of all ages who are on this webinar who want to get into this field. And I want to encourage you that you can start at any time, at any age. Um, there's a variety of programming available um, for entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, obviously, I'm at a school of entrepreneurship at Babson College, but um, there's programming available, and, and we want you to leave that you can make a difference um, in the fight against trafficking using entrepreneurial solutions and innovation. So uh, please feel free to contact me, or I can get the contact information for any of our speakers today. I know that they would be more than willing to help any of you on the call today. Um, in any of your endeavors. So I have to go through a list of thank yous because it's been a whole team of people um, to put on this webinar. Firstly, I have to thank John Florendo and Zach at Babson College who are, um, who've been working the technical administration from afar. Normally we're together, so um, they've been great doing this with me remotely. I also want to thank the OECD um, where I'm at their headquarters in Paris right now for um, finding me a room and, and the ability to broadcast here. And I want to thank, in particular, um, Pauline, uh, Jerome, Michael, and, and Jack, who, who were so helpful in, in um, getting me to be able to facilitate this here. So thank you for your efforts in the midst of um, many, many meetings here this week at the OECD. Uh, I also want to make an announcement for our next webinar. Uh, which is going to be taking place on Thursday, April 20th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. Central European Time. We're going to be talking about law enforcement and new media solutions, and we're going to be hearing from the perspective of those um, who are law enforcement professionals and what they're seeing in terms of technology and how this um, crime is changing um, and also um, what new technologies are, are either influencing this crime um, and also what's available. So we really hope you'll join us for this um, important conversation and uh, perspectives. And I've sent around the link to register, and you'll be receiving uh, that from us for those who are already registered with each of our listservs. So again, thank you for sticking with us for the two hours. I know it's, it's so hard. We've gone over a little bit, um, but it's been an extraordinary conversation. And I wish all of you um, a wonderful uh, rest of your day evening, and, and I hope that you go out and uh, seize the opportunity to really change the face in, in, the, in the fight against modern slavery. Thank you to you all. Bye-bye. Hey, Zach, are you there?